वेलकम टू दिस सीरीज ऑफ वेबिनार टेन वेबिनार्स बाय स्मार्ट हैबिटेट फाउंडेशन स्मार्ट हैबिटेट फाउंडेशन इज एन एक्सीलेंस फॉर आर्ट एंड आर्किटेक्चर एंड फॉर ह्यूमन सेटलमेंट इनिशिएटेड बाय क्रिएटिव ग्रुप एंड प्रोफेसर चरणजीत शाह फॉर द लास्ट फोर इयर्स वी आर वर्किंग ऑन वेरियस एस्पेक्ट ऑफ आर्ट आर्किटेक्चर you know like uh, we have various debates with the uh, students of architecture and uh, teachers of architecture colleges so that the interface between the practice of architects architecture and the teaching methodology could be understood we have various like indo russian conclave and it's like a global uh, debates by global architects and also allied professionals like pmc project management consultants construction management consultants financial management consultants quality management consultants structural engineers mep architecture plus art and sculpture put together we have uh, the vice president mr dr r s o d good p shah we have uh, advisory in terms of more than 400 uh, Uh, professionals including uh, various uh, more than 200 uh, head of the departments of school of architecture plus practicing architects then the green consultants structural engineers mep consultants all the eminent personalities are participating in giving the advice in terms of creating green indian sustainable architecture and these are the glimpse of the various workshops we start you know we teach the students you know for about 15 days in house and then they do the publication so all these things are being done at smart habitat foundation with the help of all my colleagues architects friends and other professionals now we club with the socam gems you see mr pankaj dharkar mr hiranandani mr menon all are now club together in choosing the support of ashray ishray even fsai and all those allied bodies are also coming forward and we are having a joint platform and now created these 10 webinar discussion on various elements of building industry in terms of creating that sort of an understanding so that we have the interface between all of them together these are some of the publications we have uh, made uh, for publication for evolution of uh, steel we have also done uh, on um, smart uh, uh, city planning and that is all what we do and now we hope for a very large platform with socam and smart habitat foundation to take it further thank you very much wonderful video so uh, dear friends ladies and gentlemen this is the session of our webinar partnered foundation series we are discussing about with sustainability and green covid era and covid 19 the topic this smart and sustainable green human settlements post covid 19 dear friends we have wonderful speakers with us speaker from all over india we have speakers from rajasthan delhi punjab gujarat and one from inter one interested speaker also so uh, myself neeraj arora and senior director and head sochem i look after the gem green building certification program of sochem and uh, sochem and sustainable habitat foundation are jointly doing this our today's moderator is architect gurupreet shah who is the secretary general of smart habitat foundation and is the principal architect at creative group now i will hand over the session to gurupreet shah gurupreet over to you thank you neeraj ji thank you so much 
I thank uh, the audience for participating and I hope that you would be having a wonderful time. We have some very great uh, panelists, uh, a very rounded uh, panelist uh, from all across uh, architecture and the uh, engineering fraternity. I would like to introduce first uh, Mr. Pankaj Dharkar. He is a renowned personality, does not need any introduction. But still, for the sake of it, he's a, he runs PDA in Ahmedabad, uh, which has been doing very innovative, sustainable design solutions in the field of building energy, HVAC, electrical, especially vertical transportation. He is the national chairman of GEM Council for Green Building Certification Program by ESOCAM. Currently, he's also the international president of FSAI Fire Security Association of India past national president of Ishri. I welcome you, sir. Yes. I also welcome our uh, other panelist, Mr. Surinder Bhaga. He's a renowned practitioner in Chandigarh. He's the organizational head for Sarkar uh, Foundation in Chandigarh. Mr. Bhaga has also been awarded by Hudko for his uh, work in energy efficiency, especially in housing. Currently, he is the member of advisory committee of India's Home Ministry on Union Territories. Recently, he has been appointed as head of Chandigarh sub-chapter FSAI and chairman of GEM Chandigarh. Welcome you, sir. I also welcome Mr. Tushar Sogani. He is the manage managing director of TSDPL, uh, an architecture practice in Jaipur. Currently, he is doing more than 50 million square foot of area under various uh, projects in terms of design consultancy. He is the chairman of JAM Rajasthan chapter, vice chairman of Indian Institute of Architects, Rajasthan. I welcome you, Mr. Tushar. We also have with us a very eminent uh, managing partner of NMA, an award-winning architecture design practice based in New Delhi. They have been designing various uh, planning and architecture works, especially uh, their forte is sustainability. Mr. Manchanda has been teaching in TVB School of Habitat Studies, School of Planning and Architecture, and I guess he would be bring, bringing to us a great mixture of uh, academic and uh, practice in terms of his thinking. I welcome you, Mr. Neeraj. We also have with us uh, Shneel Malik, a very young and dynamic uh, architect, pursuing uh, her PhD from UK. She is doing something very interesting, uh, bio-integrated design. Uh, she has been working very extensively and uh, she has been exhibiting her work in various parts of Europe, especially Paris, London, Estonia. I welcome Shneel and I think she will be able to give us something very young and very, uh, uh, you know, off the beat, which we might not be totally aware of. And her research of bio design is of special interest in today's uh, context. Welcome, Shneel. Uh, I would also like Thank to welcome so Mr. Anand Tushar. Uh, Mr. Tushar started his practice in 1984. He has successfully completed large number of projects in various countries, India, Africa, UK, USA, specializes in R&D centers, laboratories. I think his forte is pharma and townships. I welcome you, Mr. Tushar. So you can see that uh, we have a vast diversity in terms of uh, the panelists. And I think, uh, you know, this, the word redefining smart is sustainable green human settlement post COVID is in itself very interesting. So there are three key words, uh, smart, sustainable, and post COVID, which I think uh, are something that are all of interest to us and are very challenging in terms of understanding. Just to give a context, uh, I think uh, all of us have been, you know, devoting the 45 days in lockdown and have been doing a lot of introspect. So there is a lot of introspect and we need to understand, you know, what this is a pandemic or this is a planned pandemic. 
so the question uh, is something that uh, is directly related to in terms of how the human behavior has been in terms of the evolution and the two key words smart and sustainable sustainability i believe is something that we have inherited from our old cities and in terms of our vernacular architecture and especially everyone is aware that jaipur old city of delhi jaisalmer are great uh, examples where in terms of mutual shading courtyard planning utilizing uh, the movement of the sun are the key elements in terms of uh, how the human settlement was designed but the, at the same time it is also very important that we are all part of nature and uh, you know we are very minuscule because eventually the whole ecosystem runs uh, uh, holistically but human species very interestingly always has this habit of taming the nature we always play with straight lines the first civilization the harappan civilization was also planned uh, in a grid however if we look at nature we seldom see a straight line nature is very organic and full of n number of algorithms which are sometimes visible sometimes invisible to the naked eye and one perceives as per our evolution in terms of perception with that in mind slowly we have evolved from a human scale settlement to a car based motorized settlement where i don't think there is any space for a, a human to walk these days so the walkability has been lost in this in this uh, progression towards uh, more smartness in the progression towards achieving more in terms of uh, our greed so the question to the panelist is at large is to understand how this human scale has been lost and we have transformed towards the car scale today we hardly can walk in any of our so called smart it enabled wi wi fi enabled cities yet we are very smart in times to come by 2008 almost two third of the globe would be living in urban areas by another by 2050 almost more than 80% of the population would move towards the urban city so from the cities to mega cities are uh, push towards uh, sustainability would be the key since the lot of uh, load would shift towards usage of resources and non biodegradable materials would really kill the mother earth so how we can make it more sustainable how we can push the limits in terms of probably going back to the nature or how do we think about reduce reuse recycle maybe these are very common words but they need to be thought about very carefully even agriculture is something that we need to think inclusively maybe cities have to have agriculture as part of it or maybe uh, the jungles have to come back so where do we go from here is something that i think uh, i would like to hear from all the panelists and i would like to open from uh, our, one of our most renowned panelists mr pankaj dhakar so sir i would like to ask you how the how do you believe as a very reputed mep and fire designer you have designed more than i think 1000 buildings uh, in the country how do you think that uh, redefining smart and sustainable settlement post covid 2019 so sir what do you feel is the role post covid 2019 thank you sir and uh, just to correct my introduction i am no more uh, international president of fsai i am i was international president so uh, my apologies if i started with that but uh, let me first of all thank uh, charanjit singh ji for associating with asocham gem uh, so thanks to smart habitat foundation all members and i think this is going to be a fantastic time for 10 such a wonderful series with um, involving many national and international uh, architects of repute uh, so thanks uh, 
Shasa for that wonderful association with Ashocham Jam. I'm sure this mutual um, arrangement and understanding will help us uh, go a long way. Uh, so coming back to question, uh, sir, uh, uh, we all know that COVID-19 uh, viral outbreak is likely to bring some permanent changes in the life style of people that may help in preparing for the future. And of course, uh, building will, will play a more important role with such epidemics since um, we have to stay indoor most of the time. Uh, so importance of sustainability in building and MEP systems can make the lifespan of building longer and enhance the health of uh, occupants. The connection between uh, physical environment and wellness will be more stronger than ever before after COVID-19. So prevention and control, the key elements when facing such uh, major um, health crisis. So we will have to design our sustainable building in such a way that uh, they are not only fire safe, but also infection safe. I've been again and again uh, using this word because infection safe is going to be a key element in future developments and well-designed MEP and life safety system in building to maintain required humidity levels, airflow, differential uh, pressurization. Differential pressurization is something which probably architects will start listening from MEP consultants uh, quite often because it directly relates to infection. Uh, smart controls of operation, innovative ventilation and filtration technologies and appropriate PHE system will help in maintaining healthy and safe indoor environments. So MEP services can play more important role in prevention and control strategies of building. So most important aspect which, will, which we will start seeing is uh, uh, increased ventilation. Ventilation is going to be very crucial in diluting contaminants, uh, bringing in outside air, which is filtered or treated or opening windows wherever possible, which was always a part of our heritage designs, uh, which I'm sure my uh, forthcoming speaker uh, from Jaipur is going to speak about. Uh, that has been our wealth we lost somewhere. So wherever possible and regular monitoring of uh, indoor air quality will be most essential part of uh, our designs. Buildings will have to be enhanced measure of for controlling the collusion of air and pollutants, controlling the exhaust backup backflow of for the kitchens and bathrooms, setting up an effective water seals to reduce risk of virus transmission through drainage pipes and tools, controlling the concentration of uh, indoor particulate matter are going to be very key elements uh, in future developments. Maintaining right relative humidity mix increased. We all know increased humidity makes a building unpleasant for occupants and can also help in growth of bacteria, while low humidity can increase the growth of viruses like COVID-19. So systems will have to be implemented to maintain um, relative humidity between 40 to 60 percent to prevent the growth of microbes within the buildings. Friends, uh, ASHRAE has taken steps to provide guidance to how to ensure that buildings are prepared for future epidemics. Uh, many of us uh, in India are also actively participating in this global program of ASHRAE. ASHRAE has an epidemic task force uh, which has been ad ad established to address the challenges related to effects of HVAC systems on disease transmission in building. And I'm very glad and I'm really happy that uh, Ishre has come up with a guideline where they have put together um, um, all possible solutions and guidelines uh, with a special COVID-19 task force uh, set up in leadership of a technical committee. In addition to describing the virus and its transmission route, Ishre has also looked into effect of environmental conditions, particularly humidity, relative humidity and temperature in residential, commercial, and industrial applications. And I would urge all of you who are listening today and who, who have interest in this, they must download the ISHRAE COVID-19 guideline. The requirements in building uh, will also now start seeing thermal scanning, quick access to medical facilities, vehicle management, uh, relevant signage to alert people, flexibility in changing 
of room functions and wherever necessary, like creating medical rooms, residential room, isolation and observation room, uh, supply storage, etc. So these all have a lot of impacts on MEP uh, as this will become a little more max flexible than what it used to be. So post COVID-19, importance of an integrated design practice will become more essential for successful implementation of, of prevention and control strategy in modern and sustainable buildings. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pankajdi. Thank you so much for letting us know in, uh, in terms of technology upgradation in the systems. And I'm sure uh, going through the ASHRAE guidelines uh, would further enlighten us. I would like to move towards our next speaker, uh, Mr. Surinder Bhaga. Uh, sir, I think uh, you have been having a great experience in terms of living in Chandigarh and uh, you know how a planned city really works. Uh, I would like to ask you how can we make sustainable human settlement in rural India based on your uh, experiences, uh, especially in Chandigarh and uh, other parts of the country? To you, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Gurpreet. Thank you. Uh, we all know that about 70% of uh, country's population is uh, living in villages. And village is a mother unit of India, which is feeding the entire nation. And uh, villages are having almost uh, negligible facilities in terms of medical facilities, water supply, roads, jobs, employment, whatever you call it. And if you compare uh, the density of the of a, any typical city and a typical village, you will be surprised to know that Bombay's uh, per square kilometer density is 30,000 persons per square kilometer. And in a village, on an average, it is about 1,000 persons per square kilometer. And Gurpreet was talking about what will be the scenario after COVID-19. My opinion is that you will hardly listen any COVID patients in, in villages of India because we are self-sustainable. Uh, you know, the cow dung is being used in uh, as a manure in, in uh, agricultural fields. And there's no wastage. There are no uh, wastage dumps. There's no uh, dirt in spite of the fact that very little attention has been paid to the villages. Now we have very great success stories in India and abroad where villages have come up like model villages. There is one example in Maharashtra state, the village is called Anandwan. Anandwan is a name like it's a jungle of joy, it's spread over nearly 500 acres of land. And it was established by Baba Amte. Baba Amte has uh, set up that village to accommodate nearly 2,500 uh, leprosy patients. And uh, this village is uh, self-sufficient and it got almost everything. You call solar power, you call uh, biogas plants, and uh, there are check dams, there are uh, uh, all other hospitals and everything is there in that village. And inspired from this particular village, about one dozen villages in, in and around that area in Maharashtra uh, are following those traditions which are set up by Anandwan village. Second example, I will quote from uh, Indonesia. There is a, in a local language, they call it Kampong Pilangi is the name of the village. In English, they call it Rainbow Village. Rainbow Village is a village which was in a very bad condition. It was slum-like conditions in that village. A school teacher of that particular village has taken up the initiative and uh, he was an art teacher basically. He has done painting of the entire village. He has put uh, murals on the walls and he has done decoration of the entire village with the help of the villagers and with the little small help from the government of that country. And the result is that village is num one of the number one villages from the tourism point of view today in Indonesia. That is the second example. 
then I happened to go to Islamabad in Pakistan. In Pakistan, I asked a friend there that uh, Islamabad is a city like Chandigarh, a planned city. I asked him what I can see here. He says that you must go to Sadpur village. Sadpur is a small village which is uh, encircled by uh, by the Islamabad. The Capital Development Authority of uh, Islamabad, they hired a French agency and they upgraded the entire infrastructure of that village. And uh, you, when I went there, seeing was believing. It was the ultimate beautiful village where the temple was preserved, a Gurdwara was preserved because no more Hindus and Muslims are living, uh, Hindus and uh, Sikhs are not living there, but it was uh, there before the partition of the country. They have preserved a Gurdwara very nicely, a Hindu temple very nicely, and uh, they have made, uh, you know, all sort of arrangements like uh, parking, cafeterias, uh, sewerage treatment, all that is done there. Then after that, I, I happened to invite uh, the waterman of India, very famous, who became very famous, uh, Dr. Rajendar Singh to Chandigarh. And I was talking to him. Uh, he, we all know that he got a Magasis Award. He has created 10,000 check dams in Rajasthan and given water supply to nearly 1,000 villages. And the statistics show that the uh, area under forest is grown, the yield of the crop has uh, increased, and villagers have become self-sufficient, and 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 so on. And as in the at the end of it, I would like to say that uh, there is a lot of scope that we can very easily do uh, redevelopment of our villages with a very less cost. Then uh, people like uh, Baba Balveer Singh Sichewal is doing a great job in Punjab in the redevelopment of the villages. And uh, uh, we think, uh, I think that we can take cue from all these uh, best examples which we have in India or abroad and make our villages worth living. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Surinder Ji. And I think uh, the village example is fabulous. And it really talks about what India is all about. Uh, and it also, I think uh, I'm recollecting the slogan, uh, my friend Fred told me, less is more. So, you know, this whole intent of uh, going to the mega cities, if our villages become sustainable, if our villages, uh, we are able to create a full ecosystem, then I think uh, the whole logic of further pressurizing Mumbai's and Delhi's going beyond that 30,000 uh, persons per kilometer, per Square, square kilometer would definitely help us a lot. Uh, it's a great thought. And I think this atmosphere of COVID where work from home was a forced uh, thing on us. Also gives us a cue that villages or small towns, the whole economics might change and the viability uh, in those areas may come back. So the planning principles of sustainability would be key to actually make them much more sustainable. Yeah. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, go to Mr. Tushar. Tushar ji, uh, I would like to uh, you know, ask you in terms of your experience uh, working extensively, especially in a city like Jaipur, which, is, which has so much to offer in terms of its great heritage, in terms of you know, all sort of sustainability, in terms of uh, you know, one, once you go there, you can see Hava Mahal, you can see a technology in its nascent sense. So I would like to ask in terms of green building, what do you think uh, post-COVID now in this current scenario, how we can restart the button? So uh, I would like to ask green building has contributed a lot in fighting against COVID-19. So do you think now is the right time to reset the button? Over to you, sir. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, absolutely. Audible? Yeah. Thank you, Gurpeet. And I think I always love uh, to be asked a question when it comes to Jaipur, as Mr. Dhakar also mentioned, you know. I'll just give you an example 
of Jaipur that which was planned in the year 1726 by the renowned architect, then architect architect with the other Bhattacharya. And you won't believe at that period of time in 1726 when there were no professional architects. The, it was so holistically planned with the local climatic condition of the area. Uh, he has planned the entire city right from macro level to micro level. And uh, just to add, I tell the, the city like Jaipur or uh, the other cities which uh, uh, Surendra Bhaga Sahib mentioned, you know, has are more resilient towards a pandemic like COVID-19. So uh, I think a recent button has been pressed by nature and everyone need to introspect. You won't believe that before COVID-19 was there in our life, only few of us people, architects, uh, MEP designers, used to talk about certain principles of sustainability. Actually, but when it comes to COVID, I'll just give you a exa small example that when daylight, I as Mr. Darker said, that daylight and natural ventilation are one of the key uh, principles for sustainability and for, for a green settlement, human settlement. But now, after COVID-19, when every one of us was, you know, um, uh, 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 was locked down, a layman in a house being locked down, you know the essence of getting a natural ventilation of daylight conditions. My mother, you know, I'll just give an example. My mother said, you have been locked down for the entire day, but I just go and feel the evening. These are the things which have come to our life. So it's really, a, it was a blessing in disguise, you know, though it was very unfortunate, this pandemic, but it was a blessing in disguise for us people, wherein we have introspected, not our um, every way of life, but we have introspected actually the sustainable and the green architecture. And I think in times to come, when this lockdown will be open, you know, so there is going to be a great paradigm shift. Mark my words, great paradigm shift. And there has to be a lot and lot of changes. I'll just give an example that today morning also I was discussing with one of my clients. I was working on a proposal of a group housing which was being perceived before lockdown. But today when he came to my office, his perception, my perception totally changes. And I'll just give you an example on the basis of my experience, what are going to be the new trends in green and sustainable architecture. Number one is minimalistic design. You know? What Gurpeet just now say, why less is more? I discussed with my client today morning itself. It was a group housing project that we have to be now very minimalistic. We have to prioritize the thing, you know. Previously, when we used to conceive any architectural project or any human settlement, we were very extravagant. Mark my words, extravagant. We were very extravagant. But now we need to prioritize the thing. We need to give more stress on the functional. So very one key factor will be minimalism in the design, which Europeans have been doing for quite a long period of time. Now, second trend will be a biophilic design. You know, a biophilic design is a concept used with the building industry to increase uh, the occupant connectivity through the use of direct nature, indirect nature, space, and place uh, conditions. So next trend will be biophilic design. Third design trend, which will which is going to govern, will be the regional approaches, which just now Mr. Bhagat told you. We need to learn from our legacy. Our ancestors, may they were not qualified engineers, not qualified architects, but they were very witty people. So regional approach is going to play a very, very, very important role. I'll just give an example of a Dhani uh, in a hot and dry climate of Rajasthan, you know. Mr. Baga said they are more sustainable in fighting against a pandemic like COVID-19 because they use vernacular material, they use local materials, they know how to sustain their build form, they know how to sustain their uh, settlements against all the odds. They have 
rainfalls they have extreme summers they have extreme winters their architecture ramlal living in that honey actually was a green and sustainable architecture so regional approach is going to be very very governing factor i remember there was a presentation few days back you know i was just listening to the architect he said that in sustainability what we talk we talk about local materials as one of the principle and fortunate to jam and igbc and grea and you know you get one mark or two marks for that we our rating agencies are so strong that they give marks for that so if the time has come it's like a cycle people uh, have started using local metal because of the two reason because of its smooth adaptability towards the present climatic condition of that area secondly again because of logistic problem you know what my builder friends and what my developer friends started thinking jo pass mein hai usko use kar lo labor zyada dur se nahi aaye material kuch aisa rahe it not come from far area so regional approach is going to cover the entire design consideration in the time scheme last but not the least very important thing is the holistic approach till now all of us were thinking in a very haphazard manner you know we are doing lot of things all together you know now our design approach has to be very very, very holistic so all these four factors design factors we will soon see in the um, day to day life of all the designers all the architects and you know i'll say that uh, this pandemic actually was a blessing in disguise for us it it was actually a blessing in disguise though it was not needed we were not prepared for it but finally you know i think in the times to come will be more stronger will be uh, standing uh, uh, within our community within our human settlements the more strong force to face such pandemics i think this is what i have in mind thank you thank you sir thank you so much i think we have enough for our needs uh, but there would always be shortage in terms of our greed so that is the key and i i think uh, mr pankaj is also there uh maybe uh, there can be some more uh, innovative points uh, for not using glass and uh, actually respecting our uh, vernacular architecture and maybe there would be also one day where we would uh, change our air conditioning from 24 degrees to 26 degrees and have our own indian system in terms of what is a comfort condition uh, with that i would like to move to mr neeraj uh Neeraj ji i think uh, you have such a great experience in terms of academics and practice uh, built together so what do you see as the key redefinition if any for smart and sustainable sustainable settlements after uh, this pandemic has entered our lives uh neeraj ji first of all uh, let me say thank you to the smart habitat foundation and to uh, asocham gems I think this is a very important uh, webinar that all of you have organized and I think the more we have conversations the more likely it is that you know jointly we can come up with interesting ideas that may genuinely inform what we do going forward so uh what I want to say is that till uh, you know covid of course covid 19 it's hopefully it is a once in a lifetime sort of a thing it's hopefully not something that you know any of this scale is not something that we are going to see any time in our lives again um and uh, uh given the fact that our practice and my personal work you know is uh, generally very sustainability centric in any case uh i think this this thing has made me and made some of us together understand that there needs to be a, a complete shift in the way we look at uh how we design how we approach the whole you know task of uh, design and building So uh I want to capture this by trying to say that uh just till covid began if you and I were speaking I would probably use the three e's to sort of capture what it is that we try to do and now those three e's stand for ecology environment and economics and uh while all those three e's are still extremely important I think it is absolutely necessary to me in my mind right now that we sort of you know change this entirely and look at it from a completely different perspective and say well no i think we should look now for the three h's which is human health and happiness now what happens when you do this is uh 
while there are certain common elements between the three E's and the three H's, uh, one is able to reprioritize a certain number of things. And many of these things have already been sort of uh, captured by uh, Pankaji and by Surenderji and by Tosharji. Uh, and uh, I will make some connections with what uh, you know has already been spoken about. So uh, when one talks about when I talk about human and health and happiness as, as a sort of a three key sort of uh, words that are now beginning to become my takeaways, um, here it is. Uh, traditional systems, on the one hand, that we seem to have lost uh, sight of as we have gone forward, you know, the whole the whole definition has been slightly technical. So if, if I just use the metaphor of the courtyard like you did, Gurpreji, on the one hand, and talk about how we existed at a particular point of time, how we, uh, how uh, Surinderji has explained, for example, even right now, we are able to sort of look at a particular kind of healthy living when we are not in an urban situation. And you flip that and uh, we look at the other part, um, the other sort of metaphor, which is bungalow, where we have sort of been, able, you know, making building envelopes which have become larger and larger with time and into these uh, larger building envelopes we are pumping air uh, which is uh, mechanically controlled which uh, Pankaji dwelt upon in, in, in some detail already and that uh, as we uh, all understand and as, as was already mentioned uh, makes us realize now that this whole business of uh, you know uh, indoor air quality and uh, how, what kind of ventilation systems we employ uh, this is going to become tremendously important in the future. So, informing ourselves once again with the metaphor of the courtyard versus the metaphor of the bungalow, or the courtyard actually is a, is a word which talks about open space, right? So, the subcontinent, I believe, has always placed very high value on outdoor living. We belong to a climate, as Tosharji said, and as you pointed through your vernacular architecture comment, where it is possible for us to lay much, much higher value on our open spaces, on shade, on simple attributes that allow us to basically exist without having to be inside built envelopes. Starting from something as simple as that and then graduating to a, a new understanding of traditional systems uh, which once again, Tusharji made a very, a very appropriate link with, in, you know, for example, in the design of uh, uh, traditionally in the design of the uh, cooling systems, systems which are as simple as you know running air through the cooler parts of uh, you know uh, deeper and cooler parts of a building before delivering it somewhere, working fundamentally with protocols such as 100% fresh air systems. India, up to very recently, was ecologically a very friendly place. Uh, if I talk about a school, in a village school, if you open the window, in a village school, we often don't have power anyway. Uh, the water supply is also, you know, debatable. So it's a very green building, no power consumption, adequate daylight, and not too much of water consumption. And now when we you know, complete this and we sort of box this building up and we sort of ramp up the energy consumption, ramp up on the technical aspects and you know, use formal air conditioning systems, the whole thing changes. So till very recently, we were a green uh, country anyhow in, in certain specific typologies and now sort of we have transformed, but it's very quickly a reset for us. We need to rework and go back to our traditional systems to see how it is that we make that connection, uh, that we make that connection once again, and we sort of graduate our traditional understandings to make it relevant for the current situation. And this part of my answer, I'd like to close by sort of explaining one of the three E's, the one that talks about economics. Uh, I'll share a personal experience with all of you, which is that there has been an instance, and uh, I think many of you uh, uh, will be able to connect with this, some of the some of the contemporary interpretations of traditional systems, uh, you know, natural cooling systems um, that we wanted to employ on a couple of projects, we used to do a calculation till two months ago. Uh, well, we still do those calculations, and we'll continue doing those calculations. But these calculations were return on investment, which means that how many years will it take for this system to through the savings that we have in 
uh, electricity bills or power bills, how much time is required for the system to pay for itself? Now, what COVID-19 has done, it has taken this whole concept of looking at return on investment of this nature of classic, you know, plain uh, uh, exclusionary economics and thrown them right outside the window. In today's context, I, I look back at those projects and tell myself, if those places had already had those 100% fresh air systems installed, we would have probably been in a very different place as far as those projects are concerned. And like Tosharji said, these conversations are now developing from an absolutely new perspective. And I feel that they are only going to get stronger. And I, and I, I have a feeling that because of this introspection and because of the very rich history we have in this part of the subcontinent in India, we are going to be able to do something very, very inventive now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nira Ji. Uh, it was great to hear about uh, you know, the synergy that can probably be brought in terms of uh, vernacular architecture and the uh, integration with the new technology. I also believe that the key word from the economics now has changed or shifted towards health, maybe. And in these 45 days, you know, we all have been thinking about our well-being. So, you know, architecture for well-being may be a change that might come uh, in, in times to come. With that, I would like to move towards Sneel. Uh, Sneel, with uh, her research on bio design, I would like to ask her. How do you see bio-integrated design playing a role in the way our... Did we lose good Rita? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we don't the teacher. Hmm. Yeah, probably had to. Let's just wait, he'll be back soon. He's, he's yeah. Okay. He's, he's yeah, uh, Neil, I think uh, I, I, I was just asking, how do you see bio-integrated design playing a role in the way our human settlements are architecturally designed uh, post-COVID? Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Pertli. This, uh, this is more than a dream, probably, to be sharing uh, a panel discussion with some most eminent architects, uh, people I've probably looked up to in my education. Um, I One thing actually that Gurpreet's a myth saying is that my journey actually started with him at Creative Group. So I, I'm a disciple of uh, Gurpreet Sir and Professor Shah. And uh, whatever I'm probably doing, weird or non-weird, is actually coming from there. So. <laughs> um, I'll probably just take a second uh, before I dive into the conversation and the question that Rupreetsa asked about what bio-integrated design really is. And it's brilliant that, um, you know, the, the concept of biophilia and the vernacular has already been touched on uh, by the other panelists. And um, as part of the research lab that I am uh, a part of at UCL, uh, bio-integrated design um, tries to move one step beyond uh, just the sustainability agenda. And we try to question how we can integrate or design living systems from the bottom up. And when I say that, that means that can our skins perform, can our building skins perform photosynthesis? just like the skin of a plant needs. Um, can we try to fabricate uh, ecosystems that exchange mass and energy with its surroundings in real time, passively, without any external energy supply? Uh, Bio-integrated design allows us to integrate a new system of materiality. So we try to develop new living materials uh, that help us to design a new fabrication tool with which, for instance, we can fabricate skins and 
living systems or even uh, like the skin of our human body uh, from the bottom up. Uh, in my research particularly, I look at fabricating photosynthetic membranes for architecture. Uh, that means that I want to find a way of developing a material that I can expand on a large scale and it perform it absorbs photo it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere releasing um, oxygen so we do this by trying to investigate new materials in our labs so um, as a scientist i sort of put on a lab coat and um, i try to make my own recipes of new materials um, an example of this material that we've developed um, is a water-based hydrogel which is completely biological and easily biodegraded. But when I make this material and I um, encapsulate living cells, cells of uh, a microorganism, a microalgae, this cell begins to live inside my material. And while it lives, it performs photosynthesis. And this material is completely water-based, but and it's viscous, right? It's like a jelly. It doesn't have a lot of structure. Uh, but then, as a designer, I can ask questions when I'm developing this material as to where the structural stability of this material can happen. Where can it become biocompatible? What is it do that I need that this skin that I'm fabricating becomes homogeneous? Um, and therefore, we also uh, 3D print. So we make our own robotic extrusion systems. Uh, that helped me to fabricate this, with this material layer by layer. So, for instance, um, I think we all know if you if you have in a material more water percentage, uh, it will be very gooey and viscous. If it has less water percentage, it will have a level of structural stability. Um, if you all would know uh, an organism, the squid. So, for instance, the squid has the hardest uh, beak. It's the toughest material found in nature, and its body also has a flimsy-like um, tail. Interestingly, it's actually deposited and fabricated from the same material compositions only by changing the water percentage, the water gradient. So when I fabricate these materials, um, I try to change the percentage of water, and my topmost surfaces, because they allow my microalgae to live, and perform photosynthesis, they become greener with time. Now, the next question would be, where do I apply this? Fine, it performs the photosynthesis, what else can it do? But interestingly, anything biological in our environment performs multiple functions. Uh, for instance, microalgae is known to clean polluted water. Engineering uh, solutions exist where they use microalgae um, to clean uh, water um, that has heavy metals and is highly contaminated. So what we designed was a wall that holds this material um, and I can circulate water through my wall uh, and receive cleaner water at the end of it. I, it's a shame I can't show images of what I'm talking about, but in uh, the project is actually called In This uh, and it's sort of dedicated to uh, the, you know, my culture and my heritage where I come from and I've got a tile actually uh, which I can maybe show you this tile so the, the, the tile is actually obviously made of crevices and the, this is my algae is dead right now but when I uh, layer the material in it and I can tessellate this tile into a wall and I circulate this water as the water trickles down the wall the algae present in my material performs photosynthesis, absorbing and capturing uh, heavy metals uh, from my polluted water. Um, now, my next, the next question you would ask me is, where would you apply this for? What, yeah, fine, very nice, what do you do? It's actually a wall which is designed um, for small scale art community communities. In communities such as where they uh, dye our textiles, our bangles, um, and just like, um, Mr. Surinderji mentioned before that um, our small communities and our developing uh, the small villages cover about 70% uh, of our demographic and none of these communities or a large percentage of these communities have absolutely no facilities 
of not just good infrastructure, but good health, sanitation facilities, uh, water, air pollution. And the idea of including biological systems within their uh, community and within their daily activities allows me to not just change their behavior, but to empower them in adapting a new technology, which is embedded in its vernacular, in its cultural uh, technique. This style that I actually showed you was fabricated in Kurja, which is the uh, ceramic capital of India. And uh, the material which is applied on this was done by the ladies that dye our textiles. And um, while there is a long-term aim that I'm able to fabricate holistic materials that are fabricated completely with just with biological materials, we have to step-by-step -step design to start integrating these processes within uh, their existing infrastructure. And this was my way of bridging the two gaps, the, the top down and the bottom up, the existing architectural facilities and our new technology. I probably just, um, I, I know we are slightly running late uh, today on schedule, but I just wanted to say one thing that with bio-integrated design, we are trying to bridge or dilute some of the boundaries between the human and the non-human. Um, the question of how architects design environments that are hosted with and within environments. Uh, greening systems or landscaping facilities exist, but then trying to move one step beyond and transforming the ecosystem, allowing our environment to revile both on a macro scale and micro scale, uh, where for instance, our surfaces have antimicrobial properties because they allow uh, the, the growth of certain good bacteria, um, allowing building existing building materials to become receptive to certain growth of epiphytes, moss, and lichens that clean pollution, air pollution, um, or a completely new materiality. And this sort of uh, suggests the idea that is uh, central, I think, to the discussion on decentralizing globalization and where uh, the ecological carrying capacity of every land that we design for is limited. But we know that somewhere we do also have to satisfy the dense requirement, the urban requirements of our city. And how we can bridge those two by acknowledging my ecological <laughs> capacity, but also uplifting my infrastructure so that it performs and adds to my ecological performance is what I'm getting at. Um, for me, uh, I constantly think, and I think the, the COVID times are uh, a big illustration of the term act local to impact global. We are all acting in our little uh, capacities to make a global impact. And I think as an architect designing for that movement, designing for that behavior change is where we are heading towards. Um, I just, um, where Gufritska in the beginning mentioned smart and sustainable post COVID, I'd rather say smart and biological post COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think the, you know, the research is very interesting, uh, but uh, it's new and it would take some time for us to understand the complexities. But the key, I think, is uh, that, you know, we have started to think in terms of getting. Uh, bio integration in our design so which is which is definitely we are talking about living uh, organism as a building so that's great that our thinking has started to uh, move ahead just not think of a building as a, a, a you know a piece of brick and mortar but as a living organism thank you so much i would like to move uh, to mr anand and uh, interestingly he has great uh, insight in terms of affordable housing so I would like to ask him uh, that in terms of the 10 smart cities initiatives in the country, especially Indabad and Pune, turned out to be the biggest hotspots and continue to struggle in terms of the COVID-19 time. Their vulnerability and fragility in tackling the current crisis was completely exposed. 
So do, what do you think? Should India revisit the smart city criteria in a major way, address realistic and contextual issues? How are we prepared to combat these kind of disaster and pandemics uh, in the 17 goals that have been laid down in the smart city formation? Over to you, Mr. Anand. Uh, thank you, Gurpreet Ji. I thank at the outset uh, Professor Shah for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak about this. I would touch upon more the planning aspects of uh, settlements. Uh, after the previous speakers who have uh, spoken more about architecture and uh, some of the details, I would like to uh, inquire, I would like to examine where we have gone wrong uh, during this so that uh, uh, come into this mess. Uh, as, as mentioned in uh, Bagaji's presentation, the density is one of the major problems. <clears throat> Densely populated urban settlements have hit harder than the rural areas. The so-called 10 smart cities, as mentioned in my question, Ahmedabad, Pune, etc., have failed miserably in handling this uh, crisis. Should India revisit the smart city criteria in a major way? and address realistic and more contextual issues. Should we reset our priorities and address fundamental issues of health, sanitation, and livable housing for all? And most importantly, preparedness to overcome pandemics like COVID-19. Uh, is it time to ask ourselves whether we require smart cities or we require smart citizens or smart communities? Uh, that is a question which we should ask today especially in developing countries like India, where our resources are scarce compared to the ever-growing population exposure. Uh, it is appropriate that the title of this webinar mentions smart and sustainable human settlements and not smart cities alone. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by the United Nations Member States in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity of people of the planet. Uh, now and into, into the future, as it is uh, at its heart, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are called SDGs, which are an urgent call for action by all countries, developed and developing in a global partnership. Um, we recognize the ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality, which is very important, and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. Uh, the SDG 11 specifically outlays the vision for sustainable cities and communities. While SDG 3, that is uh, Sustainable Development Goal 3 and 6, highlight the importance of good health, well being, clean water, and sanitation, and SDG 10 talks about reduced inequalities. We need to strictly incorporate these principles while planning for sustainable settlements. Over emphasis on technology, especially the information and communication technology, ICT, should not dilute the above mentioned. Uh, fundamental goals of uh, sustainability. The technological, uh, technological bias can be detrimental in our context. Surprisingly, robust health infrastructure and preparedness to combat disasters such as COVID-19 pandemic do not feature in the 17 goals of uh, United Nations or they do not feature even in the criteria for smart cities in Indian smart city mission. After such a great loss that we have experienced now, our focus should shift on these critical issues and initiate course correction in redefining our planning rationale. We should add an adjective, one more adjective of sensible to the existing smart and sustainable human settlement. We should move from smart to wise. Wuhan, the Chinese city where the COVID-19 outbreak began, 
is the most densely populated and uh, area in China, home to 11 million people. Likewise, New York in the US is the most populated city in the US. Uh, green spaces like Central Park in Manhattan and Prospect Park in Brooklyn, residents have struggled to stay far enough away from one another to curb the spread of this disease. We can see hints of what the pandemic resilient cities of tomorrow might look like in the way the urban spaces are being repurposed. They are being converted now. Uh, in last few decades, city planners under pressure from vested interests, such as speculators and politicians, have been promoting congestion in the name of high density, uh, justified as high efficiency. Uh, we need to get rid of this obsession to maximize and replace it with optimization of the potentials of land. Our policy related to land ownership needs to be majorly reformed to stop this mindless game of speculation. Uh, if pandemics are to be a regular part of our lives, our cities will need to be more adaptable. During a crisis like we are in right now, it would mean creating temporary housing and having health centers be built more flexibility with more flexibly and have space available in cities for those one example of this is the temporary nightingale hospital uh, hospital in london converted in just nine days and able to accommodate 4000 patients and 1000 beds wuhan china also built uh, 1,000 bed hospital in 10 days. Having both the space and capacity to create these rapid temporary structures will be a fundamental part of a city built for a pandemic. The cities of the future, now what is the way forward? The cities of the future need to be more localized, not just for food, but in access to day-to-day -day amenities. Maybe the mega cities you have to create small nuclear entities and each nuclear entity has all the resources inside. One example of this, the 20 minute city, something that was being trailed in Melbourne, Australia before the coronavirus outbreak. In a 20 minute city, almost everything, everything a citizen needs from shopping to healthcare to exercise is within a 20 minute walk or bike ride. This is the concept of a self-reliant Atmanirbhar human settlement. Ancient cities of India, as mentioned by the previous speakers, including Pusharji, uh, had this concept of walkability and beautifully responded to local climatic conditions. We can get some inspiration and clues from these traditional Indian cities, respect nature judiciously, use the, and conserve resources, preserving the environment and improving the well-being of our city, citizens. Should be the end. Uh, should be the end goals for future sustainable settlements and community. So this is the kind of uh, guidelines which we can draw from our uh, traditional cities and traditional settlements. Uh, this is for now. I think. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ananji. Thank you so much. And I think with this we complete our first round of panel discussion, and we have had a varied uh, discussion. You know, hearing from the uh, engineer's perspective, from the architect's perspective, from the planner's perspective, and from a researcher's perspective. So that's uh, immense crisscross happening in terms of uh, thought processes. And now I would ask my fellow panelists to keep it short for the second round. And we would uh, like to give two to three minutes per panelist. Uh, I would like to start with Mr. Pankaj again, sir. How the gem sustainable sustainability certification program is being evolved to take care of the life safety monitoring and hygiene related issues in the buildings post covid 19 over to you sir thank you gurpreet uh, i think uh, you have heard five minute uh, architects uh, prior to me earlier with surinder ji tushar ji neeraj ji and of course ms malik and uh, anand ji and it is I'm an odd man here. I'm the only MEP guy here. Well, I think uh, 
COVID-19 outbreak highlights the importance of proper hygiene and emphasis how easily disease can spread in the modern world. Uh, buildings can either help to prevent the spread of infectious disease or can accelerate the spread and proliferation. So now concepts in building technology will have to be implemented after the pandemic so that buildings are more safe, comfortable, healthy, livable, and manageable for all occupants. We all know that all green buildings currently have five concepts, uh, which is energy efficiency, resource efficiency, water conservation, indoor environment quality, site and community impact. And all the speakers have touched these subjects. Uh, so some of the green building concepts are already taking care of required strategies, but we'll have the measures will have to be more enhanced and stringent uh, post COVID-19 in terms of how do you credit them uh, will have to be rethought. Uh, buildings in future will have to be more stringent in maintaining uh, water quality, air quality, fitness facilities, cleanliness facilities, and its use of antibacterial building materials in order to reduce the risk uh, of people getting infected and also enhance their immunity. So the, accordingly, the rating, uh, what we are currently doing, need to be uh, really adjusted by all the accredited uh, facilities. So building certification programs like GEM uh, recognizes the importance of certain aspects of building design that plays important role in making buildings healthy, safe, and secure. So ASHOCHAM has taken a green initiative to take care of Mother Earth and to complement in India sustainability movement and formed a green council of green and eco-friendly movements, we call it CGEM, that executes the GEM sustainability certification program with the objective to promote environment-friendly green building design and construction. GEM has been designed for sustainable design and development of the buildings and related developments, and GEM stands for green and eco-friendly movement. Ashochan GEM has regional chapters in Punjab, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and on 4th of uh, coming month, we are opening a chapter in UP, and our colleague uh, Tushar is also helping me open chapter in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and also in Chhattisgarh. So I'm really delighted to have a very strong team, and soon we have will have more than 10 chapters in the country. We aim to go to 40 chapter level in very uh, early stage, I'm very confident about it. The programs uh, include sustainability, energy and water efficiency. This is the only program which gives uh, credits to fire and life safety, more green area, indoor air quality, daylight pressure and human comfort. And it's also based on latest version of Bureau of Energy, uh, energy Efficiency, ECBC 2017 and NBC 2016. Since launch, GEM rating system has made rapid strides in green buildings, which covers projects across the country and many certified uh, professionals. Uh, we have rating system starting from 0 to 135 points, uh, which, uh, which uh, actually takes care of GEM 1 to GEM 5 certification, GEM 5 being the uh, best certification. Uh, it's a very simple, uh, very, very transparent system, and we are really proud of that. Uh, I think uh, post-COVID and our team is already working, uh, we'll have to give additional credits uh, for proper cleaning and disinfection techniques. Uh, so also proper hand washing facilities and signages, and also talking about uh, uh, social distancing, special uh, breakout areas, uh, innovative solutions for touch-free operations for door, windows, drawers, and other equipments. Uh, to uh, prevent spreading. So such credits will now, you will start see uh, flowing into our system. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that JEM has also, JEM is also a system which, uh, which, is man, which has a monitoring platform, which includes 24 by seven uh, access to a customized dashboard for you. Since this is a very unique feature for us, we are also training professionals uh, with uh, exams and certification is online. And currently in COVID time, we are doing it at a very reasonable cost. Uh, we have uh, already in place uh, MOUs with ISHRE, FSAI, uh, IAQA, 
um, Ashray chapters uh, in India, GACS and Smart Habitat Foundation. GEM is the only program which has included fire, FSAI Fire Suraksha Index uh, in making the safe buildings. Um, of course, this is uh, initiated by ASOCHAM, which has more than 400 chambers, 4.5 lakhs members working sir, towards creating a conducive environment. Uh, so, thank you, sir. Just to sir, finish, sorry. sir. Just to finish, with GEM ASOCHAM is now in the process of opening for various options and suggestions such that we create a new country and do not create western limited uh, word by calling green as red but opt to propagate green as green and be part of nature and managing them professionally and looking beyond net zero human settlement my apologies sir thank you thank you sir uh, to my fellow panelists, now we are almost uh, running out of time. I would request you to keep your answers for uh, two minutes. So it's already 7.25, another eight to 10 minutes at max for us. Uh, over to Mr. Surinder, Surinder ji. Yes, sir. sir, I would like to ask you that in terms of slums, you know, we have seen that Dharvi has been a great example where uh, COVID-19 fight has been very challenging. With your experience in Chandigarh, uh, what do you feel in terms of issues of slums, uh, even in a planned city like Chandigarh, uh, are bothering us? So, sir, what is your take uh, in terms of slum development in the country? Thank you, Gurpreet. Uh, I was uh, studying. Hello. Can you hear me? Absolutely, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. I was studying, uh, you know, all the planned cities of the world like islamabad like brasilia like chandigarh and many other planned capital cities of the world gandhinagar maybe i found that uh, no planner no policy maker no administration no political system has given any direction to keep uh, uh, some allocation for the poor people in chandigarh we have 250 acres of land and out of 250 acres of land if you just keep five acres for the poor people the slum people uh, the have-nots then you can easily accommodate all the slums in chandigarh we have one third of the population uh, which is living in slums even five acres of land in each sector will accommodate all of them i think that that was kabuzia's mistake there's, that was the mistake of uh, uh, other planners in Brasilia and in Islamabad. I think uh, there is a great lesson in a, uh, in a great song written by the famous lyricist Shailendra, which was sung by Mukesh. It says, Zyada ki nahi lalaj hamko thode mein guzara hota hai. Bachon ke liye jo dharti ma sadiyon se sabhi kuch sehti hai, hum us desh ke vasi hai. I don't know why planners have kept plots of one acre, uh, you know, in city like Chandigarh, where only two retired people are living, and the, the people who are doing my uh, service, like uh, uh, um, this a cobbler and all, they are living in slums. I think we need to redefine our uh, requirements. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Surinderji. I think this is a it's a, it, this is a big question, even more than planning. We have seen that uh, even in this lockdown, you know, the lockdown was planned for the rich, but what happened to the migrants is known to all. So even the government of India failed miserably in terms of thinking about the unorganized sector. So in terms of planning, it is our duty that you know we have to think more realistically that the unorganized and the organized have to live together. So that uh, connectivity and that thinking has to, uh, especially, uh, uh, you know, we have to be very, very, uh, uh, you know, optimistic about it. I would now like to go to Mr. Tushar. Uh, and sir, I would request you to keep it to two minutes. I will. <laughs> Question, please. So, sir, how do you, how can our life, a living environment be better prepared for the next lockdown that may even last longer in the Indian context? So, I guess our first experience of the lockdown has been, uh, you know, we were not aware of it. But maybe then, if, can we plan the next one? 
I think uh, we had a similar question in some webinar from the start to also. You also very upfrontly told that we are not expecting such lockdowns, you know, as such pandemics in future. <laughs> so hopefully, by the grace of God, that we do not have such pandemics in future. But if somehow it comes, I think in this entire period of lockdown and this pandemic, you know, we have matured ourselves very strong. Let me congratulate all the professionals of India, especially I'm talking about India, that we have acted very smartly. And hats off to our uh, bureaucrats also, all the uh, corona warriors, you know, they have fought this pandemic very smartly. Well, we need to hats off to them, you know. We have proved ourselves to the entire globe in a very, you know, in spite of such odds being in our country, we have done a fantastic job. Now, see, I think the most important thing, if we face any pandemic like this in the coming future, most important thing is to be a health performance, you know, in the human settlement that has to be considered. And I think we architects are very bad in uh, statistics, you know. So our friends like Mr. Dharkar, who have got a good uh, hold over the calculations and all, there has to be like we give a OC, like we give a CC completion certificate to a building after the building has been completed. There has to be a health performance certificate, you know, on the basis of what? On the basis of indoor air quality, daylighting, and other things like this uh, in fact, uh, infectious building. So there has to be certain, you know, barometer for the calculations, you know, uh, so that we can survive and we can call a building health performance building. Has to be, I was just going through some uh, research, you know, where I read that this uh, thing called NHC, they call it life cycle health performance tree. So with the help of our flavors, you know, we should try to prepare such LHC so that finally the tenants or the owner of the building have this certificate so, uh, certified by the professionals and which holds good for a good human settlement. And uh, on a lighter note, I would like to say Mr. Dharkar, he is not an odd man out. We, they are our masala in the tea, basically. So a masala tea cannot be prepared with, without the masala. So we need uh, Pankas Dharkar Saab and the people from MEP who can do a kind of lot of uh, calculations and statistics involvement in such uh, help of all. Thank you. Thank you, Tushaji. And I think uh, the takeaway from your talk is that, you know, maybe the change is something uh, which is constant. And what I have learned in this pandemic is that I have shifted from my row house, you know, where I could hardly have uh, the air and the wind. And I've shifted to a smaller built up area of a farmhouse where there is more open space, where I can grow my own agriculture and where I can actually see the sun and I can sit outside. So maybe the change is that, uh, you know, this whole intent of living with nature uh, has to come back to the society at large. And I, with that, I would like to uh, go to Mr. Neeraj. Sir, I would like to ask you, how would you illustrate those changes that may directly impact how we design after COVID-19? Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll keep it short. And I think uh, it, it, it's, it's a coincidence. I was uh, planning to, one of the examples that, uh, you know, uh, has been foremost on my mind uh, I briefly already touched upon which has to do with how these uh, uh, conventional system uh, the the traditional systems that we have for cooling uh, have a new relevance for us today and this uh, basically tells us that the conventional manner that we have employed currently of seeing what are the economics of the decisions that we make as designers this part uh, needs to be sort of reanalyzed uh, you know from certain points of view and um, uh, before I sort of get to that, uh, I must say that I agree with uh, Tosharji uh, that uh, Ankurji's inputs are not only, uh, this is not an odd man out situation. In fact, anyone who's dealing with subjects like air quality is actually central to this whole debate and discussion. So keeping that in position and also saying that uh, what uh, Surinderji mentioned, I, I really liked his comment regarding, uh, you know, the attention that we perhaps need to pay. Uh, he, I think he was speaking about slums, but I'll just use that uh, and connect that with the example, second example I had in mind. 
uh, which also links to the to the uh, to the uh, planning question that was raised by Anandji. So uh, affordable housing or this entire program, for example, we are looking at this housing for all by 2022 program just right now. And for one reason or another, uh, we have accepted within this program uh, that we should we should size uh, the EWS unit set, let's say 25 square meters each. It's time to re reanalyze whether this is the correct decision or not, whether, uh, you know, we need to ascribe this level of uh, economics alone to, to decision making of that nature. Should it be economics or should it be socioeconomics? And now I quickly go to another example, which has been foremost on my mind, because as an air traveler, uh, as most of us uh, travel fairly frequently, I have been seeing over time, uh, T1 in Delhi used to, it, it was designed uh, so as to allow for two distinct levels. And Gurpreet Ji would actually uh, also understand very clearly because he's, he, he's an expert on airports. Um, where there's a dedicated space for uh, people, uh, users of the airport, people who are going to fly out to sit and wait. And one of the things that happens when you sit and wait is that typologically the significant connection you make is with the outside. So you're looking at what's happening outside, you're able to see the planes. Dec decisions such as, you know, uh, introducing a retail into these spaces on the back of uh, uh, certain economic considerations, which tighten up these spaces and make less space available for all of us who are travelers and more space available for the retail aspect, perhaps even sometimes cut out the line of sight we have down into the, into the tarmacs and planes. Here is another example of how we may have to relook really at some of those decisions and you know take a bit of a different view. Once again, saying that this is about social, it's about people first. It's about health, not only physical, but mental. And each and every one of these little examples uh, that all of us I'm sure will be coming up with, connect with the larger aspects of planning and connect with you know the sort of changes that we potentially have to make going into the future. Um, so that's what my uh, response on this is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neeraji. Thank you so much. I think the central point is that we need to design for the people and maybe uh, this whole idea of uh, you know moving from for the people and integrating the technology to the extent that maybe you know we have lost the central piece, the people, you know. I think that's that's where we probably need to go back. And COVID is something that is reminding us that nature and for the people needs to come back. So with that, I would like to move to our young speaker, Shri, once again. And I would like to ask her, what are the major challenges that architects and designers face when it comes to their ready integration as part of our existing built environment? I think there are a lot of challenges, obviously, because it's something completely new and um, the ready scale up is difficult. These things have been seen to work in uh, research labs, in small petri dishes and science experiments, but then trying to scale up as an architect is what's very difficult. We don't have currently supply chains and we don't have manufacturing facilities that will help us to readily make these systems uh, and to fabricate and make them happen. That's one thing. But then before that also, I want to point out that the life cycle of anything natural, it's slightly different than the life cycle of a building. In one year, we have four seasons. In those four seasons, leaves grow, fall out, and then grow again. And when we design for a system to perform like that, if we, it will begin to change with season. And that uh, fine tuning as a designer is very difficult because we are architects at the end of the day. We want these systems and places to be used by you and me. Um, but then we also want to be um, holistically um, closer with nature. So it has, um, the next challenge as a designer that I personally face sometimes is what are my design tools that I learned in my undergrad, in my master's, in my PhD? And what are the new design techniques that I want? And that sort of switch is um, a bit difficult, but I think it is 
the more we sort of try to execute it in real life, it when the answers will keep feeding back. So this sort of gap between the research and the industry is still a bit wide. And uh, for me, for instance, the wall I mentioned about, we are working to execute and implement the first pilot project in January next year to figure out where the material comes from, who makes it, who, make, who takes care of the system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's also one last thing, I'm gonna keep it super short. Um, I'm a very small person to say this, but for me, I think that some of the standards with which we design, this, the basic standards of spaces, how do we use a, a room? What, is, what does the window do? Um, how does it uh, create a separation between the outside and the inside? Those sort of standards, when we start thinking from nature's perspective, can be slightly fine-tuned. And I wouldn't have answers to what these standards are, but I think doing a little bit of more research and designing and executing them in real life and seeing will help us to feed all the incredible list of points that actually um, all the other panelists have been talking about, especially the regulations that have been put in place by um, GEM. It's incredible. So um, I think those are the two things, scaling up, and executing in real life is slightly a bit of a challenge and um, standards. Thank you. Thank you, Shneet. Thank you for uh, the insight. Uh, I would like to now move towards Ananji. And Ananji, last two minutes, over to you. Uh, can the reverse migration of the labor be considered as an opportunity to develop smart, sustainable, and resilient rural settlements? adequate job opportunities and i think this is a very very relevant question because this is uh, something that we have all uh, experienced and felt uh, a very live question uh, which has really bothered the whole government uh, machinery over to you ananji uh, i think all of us have, have experienced this, this last two weeks uh, this migrant movement migrant labor movement had uh, been occupied all the headlines of uh, printed and uh, electronic media and we've seen that what kind of ordeal this uh, lot has gone through and uh, after so much of uh, difficulties uh, it is likely that these guys will not come back uh, so soon anytime soon uh, and experts say that they it may take eight to ten months for them to come back and many of them may not come back at all. So there would be problems at both ends from where they have left and where uh, their native places, native states, where so many uh, people have uh, once again reverse migrated. That means there's so many more people now which uh, be there in the villages or towns or, uh, you know, states like uh, Bihar or Jharkhand, uh, Chhattisgarh, etc., etc. So they will have to now, uh, if they if they have to survive, government have to come in and create some kind of infrastructure, improve the conditions and enhance the infrastructure, which has now been under so much of pressure because of the returning migrants, returning laborers. On the other hand, uh, uh, and we should you know take advantage of this situation when government has. Uh, declared such a big stimulus package in all these sectors, uh, we should you know, try and implement these uh, sustainable principles while improving or enhancing the uh, infrastructure, social as well as physical, in the uh, areas where these people have gone back. On the other hand, from where they have left, for example, in Gujarat, Surat, there were some uh, 17 lakh migrant workers and 12 lakhs of them have now returned and maybe a large percentage of it will not return so what will happen to the industry which was uh, you know being run by these um, workers migrant laborers so there uh, they will have to replenish this uh, uh, you know the loss which there they, who they have lost this a lot of you know uh, migrant workers so what this opportunity can be taken up to develop local uh, labor force by by way of uh, training them in skill development centers and you can probably uh, train them to 
to suitably to serve this industry which is now at a standstill because there is no labor so it's a win-win condition on both sides uh, more more importantly uh, the local labor force all of them may not require uh, new housing so there would be vacancies in uh, there would be a lot of uh, vacancies in the current uh, housing which was being used by this migrant labor most of them were like slum like conditions you know very shanty like conditions so you will get an opportunity to decongest this and probably improve facilities and amenities in these settlements so both sides you see uh, that will be in a way a step towards this atmanirbhar or self-reliant settlements that's what i feel great thank you thank you ananji uh, and i am i understand that we are running out of time i would just like to summarize that uh, maybe you know uh, we can't uh, live without the unorganized sector or maybe the unorganized needs to be organized and uh, it's it's a beautiful thing that we need to now be more uh, uh, informed and we need to start to respect nature and we need to think about the unorganized probably we need to think about blurring the boundaries between inside and outside and even the planning principles need to uh, look have a real look and we need to start to think that there has to be a coexistence of planning and uh, of unorganized planning so that needs to come together thank you so much i would like to really thank all the panelists for giving their varied opinions and i would like now, now to uh, pass on this to our organizers mr neeraj thank you so much yeah thank you gurpreet ji it was the am i audible absolutely absolutely thank you so much i think now the internet connection is better since we start so thank you so much gurpreet ji it was a really uh, excellent session and what i can say is uh, there were around uh, 700 plus uh, delegates attending the webinar and still uh, we have 600 plus who are you know still uh, listening to us so this is uh, an excellent uh, because you know uh, they were keen to listen to our wonderful speakers, so they are still with us. Uh, now we have uh, with us architect Charanjit Shah, who actually initiated the series of webinar, and this is his uh, creation. He, when the lockdown started, he thought of that: why don't we should utilize this time to discuss uh, sustainable aspects? So he initiated this. And uh, Charanjit Shah Saab is the senior advisor of SOHM GEM Council. So he asked SOHM to join for this wonderful series. And this is how we joined. So now uh, I would request architect, architect Charanjit Shah Saab to say a few words on this and to let us know that what next we have in our next webinar. We have our next webinar on 29th May, which is again a very wonderful topic. So Charanjit Shah Saab, now it is over to you. Right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my dear Neeraji and uh, SHM James team and my wonderful speakers. Really enjoyed every word of my speakers. And uh, I think uh, is the time to really uh, go inward and uh, do some uh, sort of uh, understanding. Uh, the valid, uh, you know, uh, speakers thought from. Uh, Mr. Anand to Mr. Baga, where uh, and Mr. Neeraj and Mr. Toshar, uh, in a sense, you know that how uh, this opportunity can be used for decentralization. Maybe that urban growth could be controlled, which was actually flooded with so much, uh, uh, you know, migrant labors, other things put together. And now, suppose the labor has gone back. Can we, from taking a lead from Mr. Baga, can we really think of that uh, we give, uh, you know, there was a, a, a proposal, a, a, this thing, a project by the government, like providing uh, urban um, uh, facilities in the rural, rural areas. So if possibly we can create that sort of uh, urban facilities within the rural areas, the rural areas can be self-sufficient and migrant uh, labor need not migrate only essentially where it is required, there we see that they clearly migrate and probably the problem which Lee Kabuzi or other people could not foresee 
that why this migration is taking place that is also a question to be understood perhaps it's a very large understanding one has to really understand many more things put together and uh, to me you know after looking into it is like uh, understanding the out uh, you know the indoor quality the outdoor quality the environment how do we really create all these things put together is a big challenge and we have as physical planners we always look for uh, passive ways of physical planning in terms of various aspects but when it comes to mechanical ways the active ways just so sometimes it we are overshadowed i am not criticizing anybody the maybe may, may larger uh, uh, you know global uh, facilities like ashre or other organizations they practically sometimes it is not only intervention but it is empowerment and in that process we lose our heritage our other alternative ways of doing economical ways of uh, you know various uh, air qualities perhaps now next uh, uh, we have uh, 10 uh, of the uh, webinars which are in the process on various aspect from air quality to fire to uh, we talking about real estate we talking about project management we are talking about uh, real estate management we are talking about construction management all these things are in the process every week we are having uh, one of these uh, uh, seminars in collaboration with our uh, larger player which is asochem uh, gems and next time now next friday is we talking about the air syndrome the inside quality of air perhaps if outside quality is not good how can i get a quality inside which is good for me so the both things need to complement each other and we need to discuss find a solution wherein we are not mitigating but we are finding a solution forever not that today we have covid and we talking about many more things of distancing and other things put together can we make something which is lively which is understandable which is sustainable but as surinder ji has said that in villages we are still safer we do not find this problem so much in urban areas and these are some of the points which needs to be seen now thank you very much all of you i will hand over to mr neeraj again to announce uh, the subsequent um, uh, uh, webinars for the you know every every friday from now we are cutting down to one and a half hours in the two hours and uh, maybe perhaps 6 to 7:30 every friday we will have and let's see that we all progressively do something which really conclude in a very nice manner and we really we sort of our all our confusions of mind are practically derated and we we'll say yes we are living in a proud india which was sustainable earlier and today also we proudly say yes we are sustainable and we live with nature perhaps that we have forgotten this lesson is which we have to take an intake and is yes neera ji back to you thank you very much i applaud for all of you for giving your time and let's see that unitedly we can do this this is the platform where we trying to put all architects artists meb consultant real estate players project management put together so that we create holistic human settlement which is best for all and we say proudly yes we are all professional club together and making our strong india which is make in india made in india thank you over to neeraj ji thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much your message was really very very energetic and very encouraging so uh, i think one, we have received many questions from the audience but one question which i like most i mean we are doing webinar since last two months but this question came first time uh, from any audience so i will take one question only uh, but before that i would like to announce two uh, announcements one that we have our next series of webinar on 29th may at 6 pm again the topic is air syndrome in post covid 19 capacity building so uh, our speakers will be mostly from uh, uh, engineering side and they will be uh, guiding us with how air quality or this thing should be you know improved in our buildings so uh, and ne next announcement is that sochem gem council is conducting one webinar on gem training program which will be followed by gem online examination 
this exam and webinar will be conducted on 30th may and as i as told by the darkar sir for uh, during lockdown shm has cut down the fee for that examination earlier that fee was 5000 rupees but now the fee for that webinar and examination is just rupees 3300 so we have cut down the fee 35% just to consider the lockdown and the last date for uh, submitting that uh, application is 28th may and 30th may is the date of the webinar so please join us for that webinar also thank you so much uh, so now i will take one question i mean uh, and this question is open to you all anyone can answer or more than one speaker can answer because we have 9 uh, minutes from now so the question is uh see uh, this question is very valid because the attendee is saying that covid 19 pandemic or such pandemics happen once in a while or there might be some different muted virus will be there in future so how our architectural design or how our mep design will help us in preventing and controlling such virus i mean we don't know which virus will come next so we are preparing ourselves for covid so how our architectural buildings our architectural design and mp design should 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 so that it can help us in preventing future viruses also i mean it is very open question so uh, over to you anyone voluntarily would like to answer uh, i think yes, i'll please. answer it in a very you know short and crisp line you know uh, as i told earlier also that this was a blessing in disguise you know because of this lockdown this pandemic this covid 19 you know which is i am damn sure never going to come to us this is for sure but this has given a lesson to us uh, the kind of uh, inappropriate architectural designs maybe which we were doing you know it's a time to correct ourselves it was a lesson to us and it was a lesson to us mankind basically to save our mother earth so basically i think that uh, we have introspect ourselves in this lockdown period we have learnt of lot of things now mark my words in all the green building settlements or whatever we call it in built form people will think in terms of passive measures you know you know they will have a less inclination towards the active measures of doing the things like creating a structure as mr mansanda said that first i you know i create a building and then wrap it with the glass i think some uh, someone told us first then what i do i first create a problem then solve it this situation will not come in future if this is the biggest lesson we architects we designers we engineers have learned out of this thing thank you Thank you so much, Mr. Ji. Neeraj Manchanda Ji, uh, would you like to add something? Sure. Um, I think that's that's really yeah, the question. Like uh, that's the question of the hour. So um, I think the way I'd like to explain this is while we have simply because of the length of time. uh in history that we have existed on the subcontinent while we have an extremely rich palette uh of responses um i think it needs to be uh it needs to be sort of a uh, relooked at what degree of sophistication our architecture and planning responses have been whether it's morphological in terms of you know how there is mutual shade in our settlements which are very dense thereby creating a favorable conditions for many for ourselves on the one hand and if you look at the social equivalent how how well developed the phenomenon of a threshold or a dehlis is which actually becomes an extended interface between the inside and the outside how we have used traditional shading systems there's a whole there's a whole long history of naturally evolved uh, wisdom that we have as we have recently uh, between let's say you know uh, early 90s and now there has been an acceleration of development we have an aspirational india most of the construction that is going to happen in the world will happen in places like india 
And we have, in order to sort of take care of this quick requirement of construction and, and building, we have adopted certain models, which so far have been relatively unquestioned. I agree with Tusharji, these models now need to be questioned adequately enough for us to interpret whatever aspirations we may have uh, without compromising on any parameters of performance or any parameters of any sort whatsoever, but reconcile them into what is naturally advantageous for us by bringing back our historical traditions and the learnings that we can draw from that. I think at a very large, at, at, at a macro level, that's fundamentally the message that comes home very, very strongly uh, as we are dealing with this thing right now. Uh, 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 can I come in? Yes, Anandhi, please. Now, uh, in this question, yes, uh, I don't think we have any control over, uh, you know, recurrence of this kind of uh, pandemic or a uh, virus. Uh, we only have to, you know, protect ourselves. So, uh, and in Sanskrit, they say that ati sarvatra varjeet, that is excess of everything, of excess of anything is not, uh, is excess of everything is dangerous. So we should try to relook at our lifestyles also. And of course, as mentioned earlier, uh, passive designs and, you know, designs which are in tune with nature will have to, we will have to resort to them. And uh, I don't think we can control pandemics or we can, we as architects or planners, have any control over these uh, phenomena. So what we can do is only try to save ourselves as, as humankind, yeah. Can I just add one little sentence to this, please? Uh, sorry. There is... Yes, um, most welcome. Yeah. I, I recently read a study which was actually written by an ecologist um, decades ago and he had suggested a concept, M-I-G-I, which is microbiome inspired green infrastructure, where he suggested using, just like how our stomach has a lot of uh, bacteria that keeps us healthy, he had suggested incorporating certain plants and even uh, materials that allow hosting these plants that create a cleaner environment but without actually maybe using an air conditioning system that extracts air from, but it does it passively, just like everybody said. So I think this concept of the MIGI will be um, increasingly incorporated within the materials that we select, the surfaces that as architects we create, and also the small rooms and volumes we extract in how we design our buildings. And it sort of adds on to how air ventilation happens, but also goes a little bit smaller and detailed into uh, the other, in my, the other um, species that are always present in our environment. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you so think, much. Uh, the key will be flexibility in design, which uh, in architecture and MEP, uh -huh. which could be reason forward yes sir yes so sir i mean uh, uh, if we if we look at uh, our last 60 65 days so what is the outcome of this corona 19 or covid 19 covid 19 is basically telling us just to ensure hygiene in our daily life just to improve our lifestyle and nothing else that's it so uh, I think uh, with this, we should end our uh, this webinar. And uh, on behalf of SOHM and Sustainable Habitat Foundation, this is my proud privilege to extend my vote of thanks to all the eminent speakers, Dharkar ji, Gurpri ji, Charanji ji, Bhaga sahab, Tushar ji, Anand ji, architect Shneel Malik, Dirati and our wonderful audience, those who patiently listening to us since last two hours, we are thankful to 
SHM's IT team, Mr. Harinder, Mr. Amit, who is working since last one week to make this webinar happen. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you. And would request you to join us on 29th once again and 30th once again. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, Thank my you. sole Thank you. lady, smart lady, uh, speaker, uh, my student, and now she's become my master because she's done the masters, and now I think in a month's time she'll be doing PhD and uh, in a very wonderful subject. And hope that uh, the youngers will take over from the older. We could make things better. So let's see that uh, younger team take it further in a very nice manner. Thank you. Thank to you all so of much. us, you, my dear friends, you all. all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tushar ji. Thank you, Thank you, Neeraj ji. Thank you, everybody. Pankaj ji, great to have you always. Thank you.